coming back to some of your work in planning streets, places, and cities. I've come to see the infrastructure of the city really as emotional infrastructure. And this is your job. You're not just helping people get around. You're designing their emotional lives. Um, some evidence. Here's one thing we know is that people are reporting lower happiness with their lives the longer their commutes are. Now, that's not super surprising, is it? The question is, why? What is making us so happy in our long car commutes? Well, <laughs> this is, are you looking in the mirror right now? Yeah, this is me this morning. So, um, in my own city, in Vancouver, uh, the, the newspaper did a study and they found that people are reporting the highest rates of incivility during their commutes when they're alone in their cars. So people who are taking the bus or walking are much nicer to other people, believe it or not, than people who are driving. Um, but the picture uh, or the influence, uh, uh, the causality of unhappiness and long commutes goes beyond that experience of being in your car and being angry. It comes down to this, and it's so early in the morning, I'm going to let you vote on this. Do you want the long, complicated explanation of what this means or just the one-liner? One -liner. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Look this up, Farber et al. on 2013, and uh, he uses a cool phrase, uh, space-time uh, continuum. So anyway, the point is, geographers have studied uh, uh, all the big metro areas in the United States, and they have found that there's uh, one factor that has the strongest influence on Americans' ability to meet up with each other, and they call it dispersal. It's pretty simple. It's the degree to which the functions of the city have been spread out across the miles. Okay, so you know all about that. This is what you do here, or what you did here for decades in, uh, in Southeast Florida. You know, you work here, you play there, you drive the kids to school here, and you're driving, and you're driving, and you're driving, and this time is seeping away from your life. It's stealing from you. And how is it stealing from you? Well, not to pick on Florida, let's go up to, um, uh, up to Atlanta. Um, a lot of data has come out of the Atlanta area, area because of the huge... Uh, disparities in development. So on the left, we have um, Mableton. Yes, Mableton. Uh, so you know, you know what this pattern is like. Dendritic street system, huge blocks, uh, poor connectivity, single use. And on the right, you have Midtown, right? So Midtown Atlanta, connected street grid, all the stuff that is in your new um, Complete Streets guidelines, by the way. Um, uh, plenty of opportunities, things you can walk to, things you can get to. There's transit, there's parks. You can live your whole life there on foot. So let's look at the system effects of these two different kinds of places. So number one, uh, on the left, you're going to admit twice the greenhouse gas emissions. Um, I was just amazed that this slide was not deleted from my collection, um, given uh, what's going on here in the last few days. But I'm not a government employee. Um, so let's just leave that if, if it's not important in the U.S. right now. Um, you're going to spend twice as much just getting around. This really matters. Um, I was so excited to see this in our goodie bag, an equity profile of the Southeast Florida region. Thank you, whoever put this together. So what does this mean? Uh, well, for Canadians, we say, well, geez, you have a second car for 35 years. There goes 570000 in retirement savings. Okay? Well, let's say you're someone who can't put that extra money away. Let's say uh, you're someone without the disposable income. This means you're not going to be able to pay for your kid's education. Hmm? You're not going to have any kind of retirement. Um, so this is a big deal when people are separated from employment and forced to uh, spend so much more on, um, on, on transport. Uh, uh, system effects, you're going to weigh 10 pounds more because you can't walk anywhere. 26% uh, of the people in Broward County are obese. This is not your fault. It's not the Doritos, it's the place that's forcing you into it. Um, you're going to die three to five years sooner because of diseases of, uh, we call it diseases of affluence, but it's really sedentary living, right? So it's not looking good. But the reason I came to talk to you today was this. This is what kills me and makes me so sad when I move through some uh, American communities, not all. So data on the United States is showing that people who live on the edge of large metropolitan areas in single-use, auto-dependent communities. You're less, you're reporting, this is not me, you're reporting that you are less likely to trust your neighbors, have them over for dinner, you're less likely to play team sports, to volunteer, or to vote. Look how that's panning up for you. Um, you're less trusting, you're expressing less trusting. I'm sorry, I promised myself I wasn't gonna go there. 
excuse me, if I've offended anyone, I'm a Canadian and we're just raving socialists, so sorry. <laughs> just, I'll get back to the evidence-based stuff. Um, from, from Europe, we're seeing that people with more than a 40-minute one-way commute are 45% more likely to be divorced after 10 years. So again, these systems are stealing the, the richness and trust from our lives. Um, is anybody else hearing that ringing noise? Okay, they heard me. Um, so number one, we need to design differently. We need to stop spreading out. And I understand that here in these counties, you've made decisions to, to stop doing that for the most part. Um, number two, we need to look at the street infrastructure itself. And look, examples I'm going to show you are nothing new to you. I think everybody in this room gets it. So I'm going to talk to you about the emotional effects of infrastructure. Perhaps you can share that evidence with your decision makers. Okay, so here's something we know, is that people who bike, or walk actually, so people in active transportation, they are expressing uh, more joy and less fear, rage, and sadness than anybody else on your street. Okay, so transit riders are the least happy, but usually that is because transit is massively underfunded. Um, so everybody likes to bike and walk. This is how people want to move. This is how people are filled with joy. Well, um, it's fun. Kids want to do it. Adults want to do it. Here's Bogota on a Sunday, right? They shut down all the streets so everybody can move. The rich, the poor, all get to move through the best streets of the city. Look at this little racer. She almost took me out. Um, so 60%, we know from the uh, studies originally done in Portland, but now repeated elsewhere, that about 60% of people in surveys say, you know, they kind of like to bike around a city. They'd like to do that. They'd like to try it out but we know that only something like three to 5% of people are brave enough to do it on this kind of infrastructure. And I think this is just across the street here. Um, I need to, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to tease you. Is, is this a bike lane? Because if it is, um, uh, it's great that you're moving in this direction and you need to move uh, further if you want to pay attention to the evidence about how people move. And so your bike uh, infrastructure is not just a necklace you wear, but infrastructure that responds to people's emotional needs and gets them cycling. So, I mean, this is Dallas, really? This is a bike lane. No, no. Um, uh, DC, this is a bike lane. No. So we know that if you put a cycle, even if you could get around this truck in this environment, the cortisol levels go through the roof. It's extremely scary. So this is infrastructure for the uh, well, a bike lane is, I think, uh, for the 15%, possibly. Um, Mexico City, thank you. So in the developing world, uh, they're taking strides that we need to follow. Um, Vancouver, I think this is one of Dale Bracewell's pictures, actually. No, Paul Kruger's. Um, we finally got around in the last decade to building safe, separated bike infrastructure. And I'm telling you, people who never would have biked are starting to do it. Uh, particularly women who would not have, uh, who would have reported not feeling comfortable are now doing it and saying they feel comfortable on this infrastructure. They now have the freedom to move. They're now saving, you know, a thousand dollars a month in transportation costs. Back to Bogota, what if, what if we really cared about our children? Knowing children report that they really want to bike and walk to school. They love it. It makes their lives more fun, more easy, more adventurous. It empowers them. In Bogota, they said, well, okay, uh, if we're building a new community, we'll build the uh, boulevard for cyclists first of all. So the ki children get priority. These guys are having fun. Okay, um, I, uh, uh, Mayor, I was so grateful to uh, get the bike map. And I'm, I noticed you, you've called it the bike suitability map. And uh, because I wanted to do some biking in Palm Beach or West Palm Beach when I was there this week. So I'm like, wow, look at all these lines. That's amazing. But then I looked at the legend of your map. And I'm like, oh, so caution means don't do it. Fair, um, fair. So this is really an assessment of the existing infrastructure. And I think what you're doing is subversive because you're sharing with people the actually unsuitability of the current network and the need to invest. So your, your fair stuff is like still, no, really scary. Good, not bad. Um, if you go, so, but I'm gonna go beyond the good. You, this is your safe, safe, separated, the new thing, right? So that's awesome. I saw it, it's great. You're doing great work. Um, but if we gave this map to a car driver in, West, in Palm Beach, you know, forget it, you're not, you're not getting on the road. So um, it's not just you, it's all of us. We have so far to go. If the intention is not just to make the infrastructure, but to have people bike and have that freedom and give those opportunities for all people in your city, okay?